Hi, everybody. It's Brian Eisenberg. And today is going to be a, a little bit of a different podcast because I'm not joined by one guest. But I'm joined by three. So this should be a lot of fun. I am joined by, of course, my longtime friend, Alan Yeager and China McCartney and Jim Batcher. And what triggered wanting to have a conversation with you guys today is I noticed you guys released a new product and there is a, a video of Jim Vatcher and, and talking about how he hit his home run, first home run and all of that and working, working with Alan. But what really caught my attention, I wanted to dig in first before we dive into anything else is you talked about this pro camp that Alan had over 30 years ago. Okay. What was that like back then experiencing it? Obviously talking about mental game and visualization today. Okay. It's a little more common, but 30 years ago, what was that like? Yeah. First of all, it was fantastic. It was one of the best experiences of my life, but it was new to guys. Alan, I feel was one of the first people, he was the first people, first person that I knew that was using yoga and meditation and plugging it in to athletics and baseball in particular, but he worked with golfers and different athletes. And uh, so, yeah, when we were laying down, we would roll out these mats and lay down and, and, and just quietly breathe. He'd put on this beautiful, relaxing music and he would talk us, he would talk us through a meditation, getting us present, making sure our bodies relax and doing body scan. And guys are probably a little skeptical when they were coming here thinking, what is all this about? We're laying down here. We're not, we haven't touched a baseball in two hours. And. Uh, but it turned out really to be our favorite part of the day because of how it made us feel. We just felt re more relaxed. And I remember because, you know, we're driving in LA traffic to, to go there and to come back. And I just remember noticing after these meditations, when I would drive back in the traffic, I wasn't annoyed by it anymore. It was very interesting. I noticed that. I'm like, cause usually I was really, I was ready to rage. You're just, you're, it's taking you two hours to go 20 miles. And I just remember being relaxed and mellow and going, wow, something we're onto something here. What's interesting to me is of course, I'm thinking back 30 years ago and I'm like, okay, Alan must've been about 14 back then. And he was running these pro <laughs> camps. <laughs> what brought you to the camp? And, and I'm curious about that because I know a lot of parents, like they, they hear about all these baseball camps. They don't know what to choose. What was it about that camp particular that really attracted you to it, that, that you knew that there's going to be something special there for you? First of all, I met Alan in college at Cal State Northridge. And I always forget about it. He reminded me one time, he's like, you realize we were throwing partners, remember? And I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. I love to long toss. And he loved a long toss. And I remember after I ruined my first partner on the first day, because I wanted to go out far, Alan probably ruined his partner. I raised my hand. I said, does anybody like to go far and stay out there a long time? He raised his hand. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. And so I knew him from college. So we had a relationship there. And so I was coming home from a season one year and he called me out of the blue and said, look, this is what I'm doing. And would you be willing to try it out? It's about breathing and yoga and meditating. And ultimately I feel this is really going to help you. And I was like, yeah, I want to try this for sure. And look, I was looking for an edge to be a better player. And so when he brings that to me and says, this is going to make you a better player. I feel this is going to make you a better player. I was all in for trying. I've always had an open mind about learning. And I think that's the bottom line. You have to have an open mind about different training techniques. Now, Alan, go, going back there. Okay. So it's 30 years. You're a teenager pulling off these camps. Where did bringing in the focus in on obviously the lying down and getting present, the breath and working that progression towards the guided meditation. And then obviously. We can talk later on about bringing that process into the game, but what got you there? Like what brought you there that you said that, okay, this is what I need to start doing in camps. 
first of all, I just want to thank you for doing this because I started doing this in 1990 for reasons like this. Hearing Jim talk is, I get goosebumps. China, I, I know he talks, he references his first camp when he was 13. And in a weird kind of way, just hearing this, the start of this, it's just, there's a lot of gratitude for you being, because this is why I started doing it. There was obviously Ken Rabisa, there was Bob Rotella. There were people out there doing it, but as Jim said, it was just, uh, especially without the internet, you just never heard about it. And I just want to let you know, and I know I speak on behalf of the guys, we're really, we're pumped to do this. We're pumped to do this together. We don't get a chance to do this much this way. For me, it was really simple. I grew up not really having, I think, a whole lot of issues or cares in the world. I was a pretty easygoing kid and, and something happened at Calvstead Northridge, which is way too long to get into now, but I went through a very tough time. I left the team for maybe two to three months and I did come back for the end of the season. And so essentially whatever happened to me, it was mental and I just I just, I wanted to find out like anybody else, like, why am I, what, first of all, there's a lot of fear. It was a very scary period because I didn't have any tools. I didn't know what was going on. I saw a sports psychologist. I, so that was the impetus to go to your question. And so I just dove deeply into the world of, at first it was psychology, but really that led me into Eastern philosophy and the real bridge for me was Zen. I got heavily into Zen. Alan Watts, he was a, a, a real, just world renowned, recognized leader in not only Zen, but just, I think, just any kind of teaching in, in general, or of spiritual psychology, stuff like that. And in a nutshell, I think that that was my, obviously my impetus. And, and once I started getting into Zen, started really meditating and then in 1990, I started writing my book, Getting Focused, Staying Focused, as a result of all of this. And that's when I reached out to Jim. I, I was writing in the middle of writing my book, and I just felt because of the experiences that I went through from both being in that dark place, so to speak, and then coming out of that and feeling like just in another world, as far as I, I felt like the person that I felt went through all that, I was... Uh, uh, I just was in a completely different space where I felt free, flowing, clear. I just felt like the, everything was happening organically and it was a very deep and meaningful state to be in. And that's the teacher part that comes out. You want to share, right? Like you feel, like, wow, like I am just, because even though I wasn't playing baseball anymore, I was playing in competitive baseball leagues. We call them adult leagues out here, Sunday leagues. I was playing golf. I was playing, I was playing sports. And not only that, if I was going out and speaking, I could feel that I would, I felt like I was in this flow, like being in a zone and I could, and I knew what, like Jim said something really cool, driving in traffic. He had this heightened awareness, like, wow, something is just, there's something to this because I'm noticing it in traffic even. And so for me, I think that was really what hit me is that I. I just started noticing, like I was in a completely different state of mind. I was in a, I was in a, I don't know what you would call it, but things were effective, things were efficient, things were just happening organically, and that was the, that was it. I wanted to share it with the world, so that's that. I'm trying to tie it all together. I when I, I describe it as a difference between and those of us with a little bit of gray will. We'll understand this a little better than the younger ones here, but I describe it as a difference between listening to AM radio and like HD, right? Like we always had that little crackle in the round. That's, that's life in general. We always get that little crackle, that little noise going around in the background. Then all of a sudden you go to an HD channel and you're in a different awareness. Like you, you can really tune into what's going on around you. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, if you, this is something we all push to, to, as far as yes. The mental game and staying in the moment, being process oriented are powerful themes that can change someone's career and life overnight. But our philosophy is very clear about this. We feel like 
it's about the practice, which is why the, the guys come out with the mental warrior program, but it's about the practice. If you're look in life, it doesn't matter what you do, whether it's tying your shoes, riding a bike or trying to hit a 94 mile an hour fastball, that's moving away from you. Those are skills. And what you're trying to do is build skills, develop enhanced skills. And first of all, you need awareness, which is the word you used already. Awareness is number one, which is why we're doing stuff like this. But number two, it's just about, okay, now we got to do the practice, right? We got to do the reps, not once a week or once every month, but it's daily. And Jim, when we used to do clinics, Jim always, always used this great metaphor, which is you don't go to a gym for two straight weeks and say, I got it. I'm there. I'm I'm the guy, I'm, I'm a guy or the gal, I, I'm worked out now, and now let's just go. Maintenance, and look, if you look at the greatest, most elite athletes or performers, or musicians, artists, of, in, in any walk of life, you can pretty much track them back to, they did the work, they did the practice, they had an open mind. And I think that's what we're trying to do is bring this to the world and this awareness that we're all doing this, everybody, the Brian Keynes of the world, the Andy McCabe's, whoever, Brent McCabe's, this is like, we're trying to bring this awareness to the world because we feel like it's the practice that is going to help get people healthier and happier, and more productive and so on. But I want to take a pass this because obviously this practice isn't just about sports and I, you I'm going to go back to, again, my college age when I was going through my mom having cancer and uh, my escape, my way of finding Zen was getting into photography. I'd go and I'd go on road trips and I'd find quiet spaces to take pictures. And just that kind of brought me into it because this, and this st stuff I learned probably a few years later, once I was starting to go more towards a social work and some counseling. And I think this is a more critical issue because obviously the skills here apply beyond sports. They apply to all the structures that we're having in life. And unfortunately, we see it with a lot of things. China, I'm sure you can speak to this. Kids 16, 17, 19, 20, like those are the ages where parents are getting a little bit older. They're starting to get those scares. They're life changing things. Grandparents may be passing away. They're experiencing different losses and they're feeling different things. They may be going on to college for the first time, whatever it is. And these massive mental stressors are there. Are we still seeing that resistance and of, of trying to learn these things at that point or like what's going on with them that they're not gravitating towards this earlier so that they're equipped to handle all these mental issues, health issues that we're going to see in life. Yeah, I think it's a great point. I think exposure is one reason they may not be lucky enough to be exposed to the concept of mental training, mental health issues. I know that's one of my biggest passions because while I was playing, I dealt with panic attacks, anxiety, which led to depression. And I was having kind of a goosebump memory thinking about the first camp I went to at 12 years old and the first time at the end of the camp. The way we would end every day at the camps is you lay down and Alan would take us through a guided meditation. And I was 12 years old. And even at that age, I didn't know what trauma was. I didn't know my parents went through a very messy divorce. My mom was incarcerated twice before I was 10 years old. And just getting permission to have peace and stillness at the camp, just it changed the path of my entire life because all of a sudden there was this different comfort with myself. And I think at first it's a little bit difficult because when you first start to try to do it, your brain goes, Ooh, an opportunity to let you know about all the crap that's in the back of your head, but that's the practice. And that's the beauty where the better you get at not engaging with that stuff, the more you can get back to the breath, the present moment and everything like that. But to answer your question directly, I think there's not as much resistance as you would think anymore, which is pretty cool to see the world changing. It's just getting the kids, the athletes, the people in an environment where they're not going to be judged for being curious about mental health or being curious about mental training. And that's where I feel so blessed 23 years ago and a full head of hair ago um, <laughs> to be exposed to this training at 12 years old 
And I didn't do it consistently the whole time. There was ebbs and flows. But I think being exposed to mental health and mental training discussions in a safe space is where you're really going to start to see some positive changes in the young athletes and the teenage years, like you said, or whenever it happens to be that you go through some trauma or adversity. The other day, Hannah Useman, who's the mental performance coach for the Rangers, put out a tweet and I thought it was so relevant to our conversation because here's what she wrote. Mental performance is one of those tools that you may not realize you need until you start to struggle. But if you wait until you start to struggle to work on your mental performance, it may be too late. Start today. How soon should people start? How young should they start? How, when do we start introducing this to kids? When should they start building this practice and the skill set so that they have it when they need it? I'll leave that to whoever wants to grab that one. I'll go second. Jim, you want to <laughs> you want to tackle it? Yeah, look, I have a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old boy at home and uh, <clears throat> it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I just want to get them outside to tell you the truth and get them exercising. If they would start this now, it would be huge. It'd be huge. The earlier the better. Whenever you're ready to do it, I guess what I struggle with sometimes with my own kids is like, if they want to go out and throw the ball or hit the ball or whatever, and I say, let's lay down for 30 minutes, I might lose them right there. You know what I mean? So at one point, I think they are going to do that. They're starting to think about it now. They're starting to think about it. I think they've done a little bit of it because of me, but uh, I would say, look, is we had a kid. Uh, at our camp, we have had several kids at the summer camp we used to do that were seven years old, seven years old. And they were the most focused little kids you've ever seen. Not all of them, they were unique and we could see it right away. Their attention span when we were talking and they got into this at a very young age and they both turned out to be absolute studs. And I think Alan knows who I'm talking about, but look, this can help anybody. Everybody goes through stressors in life. I don't care how old you are at this point, you're going through some little stressor. And if you just lay down and take a chance to and take the time to just quiet your mind a little bit and focus on your breathing, it will change you. I don't care how old you are. And what I'd add is, uh, cause I knew you would absolutely crush it, which you did. <laughs> I would add this. And it goes back to something China said about exposure too. And it's tough because Jim as a parent with two kids has gone through the path. And here's someone who's lived this for a very long time and just put out a video about it. Um, but I feel like exposure meaning at some point, look, I think back to 1990, I think back to 1998, 2006, 2012, and yes, it is night and day more receptive as China said, there's way less resistance than ever. It's actually inspiring how normalized this has become, but I still feel like until maybe this is an elementary school, there's a five minute period for breathing or relaxing, just so the kids just start to get, even if it's subconscious, unconscious connection to breathing or being quiet or getting still. Um, I feel like that's going to be a change at some point is going to happen in the world. It's going to be part of the elementary school. I think this generation now, as they become parents and they're way more in tune with alternative forms of, of healing and development, like yoga and meditation and acupuncture and martial arts and whatever, there's just tons of modalities. And I think that they're going to get to their kids, hopefully. There's a better chance of the masses, I should say, getting to the kids. And then lastly is I just hope stuff like this, the more people talk about it, the more this just becomes normal and the more people hear us saying things like, Hey, start with your kid at five or six or seven. And just like Jim said, it, it may not be easy, but it's not easy maybe to get them to eat broccoli either. So just. I think this, if people knew the effect, look, if you learn a, a language like 
French or Spanish starting at five, if you picked up a guitar at five, we all know that effect is profound on you two, three, four, five, six. It's unbelievable like how much it changes your path. So if you use that metaphor with breathing, getting quiet, learning where thoughts come from and what do thoughts really mean? Because thoughts are usually the source of stress and anxiety and worry and future and past and fear and et cetera. So I guess just to reinforce a lot of what Jim said, and, and this is really about education, awareness, but being proactive. I just think if you're a parent listening to this, and again, Jim's a great example because he's, I'm sure he's done everything in his power to introduce this the right way. So I'm not saying it's going to work with every single parent and every single kid, but the idea is that you just have to keep doing your best as a parent to beat the drum. And I'm just glad that things like this are just becoming more and more normal. Yeah. The, you guys said a few different things there that I really want to touch on, which is you obviously talked about the value of, of focus and we know kids are struggling, especially today. There's so much stressors on them more than I think in my lifetime that, that I can imagine. And just being able to help kids focus, even if it's for a minute or two. And Alan, you talked about trying the broccoli and they say that you need to at least have them try something seven times before you can allow them basically say, no, I don't like it. Cause it takes time for the palate and the brain to say, oh, okay, I, I like that. And so and it's part of what I loved about how you work the program, right? Because you focused in on building progressions and that first progression, that step one is just lay down in quiet time, right? Do it a minute or two. And I don't think that's much to ask for anybody in the first week to just, hey, can we get our kids to lay down quiet, no distractions for a minute or two? Yeah, we're, imp implementation was a huge thing for me because you can have all the information in the world, but if you don't work it into your daily routine, a lot of times it doesn't stick. It's just like at some point brushing your teeth, because it's second nature at this point for all of us. But at some point, <laughs> getting your kids to brush your teeth, you had to be on them. Did you brush your teeth? Did you brush, have you brushed your teeth? Did you brush your... And eventually it becomes second nature. And that's what I talk about in this program. If grabbing your mat, or taking the time just to lay down becomes part of your routine, part of your second nature, then this training can start taking up. But the best information in the world is not going to do you any good if you're like, ah, I tried it once and I, I lost momentum and then I just never went back to it. So yeah, it's very important, the implementation part of this, just getting in the routine. That's why the first step is just lay down. You don't have to do anything. Just see if you can get it in a habit for a week, just to lay down for two minutes. See if you can do that. If you can do that, you're on your way, potentially to, to a little more, a little more training there, a little more advanced training. Yeah. And then, and then you, you, you talk about step two, which I teased out on Twitter, having the bracelet, the breathe bracelet, which. Alan, Sammy asked you about three years ago. So I'm not going to ask you about the power of breath. Cause I think Sammy and you did a great job explaining that. And hopefully people understand why that's so important, but here's the bigger question. We start this implementation, we start going and you've guys got a four step process and we'll let you, you touch on that. But one of the things that I keep hearing, uh, we've been blessed that Sammy's been around current major leaguers, minor leaguers, independent guys high level college guys, and everybody will tell you that at some point they see their teammates, their friends, they get to a point where the game just speeds up on them. It's just too much for them. They, they can't find a way to slow the game down, which is one of the key things that you talk about with the power of breath. And China, we were talking about this. Once you get to that point where the game's too fast for you. And it happens for everybody at different points. It could be 16, it could be 13, it could be 22. It doesn't matter. Like at that point they say, okay, maybe it's physical. Maybe it's physical. They start working on their swing. They start working on their pitching. Okay. That's not necessarily fixing it. Okay. They start reaching the mental game. Now they want to start 
learning these practices, A, is it too late? But B, should we really be waiting till the problem occurs before we start developing the habits? <laughs> A, it's definitely not too late. You can do it if you're 85 years old and want to play better golf or say nicer things about your wife's cooking. It's never too late. And then B, I think everybody's going to come to it in their own time with the arm care and conditioning side. A lot of times the first discovery of J bands and a throwing program is after someone's been hurt and they're coming off a of rehab and they come to us and they want a throwing program to build that foundation. So it's not rare for a problem to be occurring to then go seek the solution. That's just how it goes. I went to my first therapy after six years of struggle. But slowing the game down, it's funny because I think the most deliberate delivery of any verbiage in the program is the outro, video 10 of the Metal Warrior program. Jim takes a pause, and I don't even know if he mentally did this, but he has the jar, the visual, and he says, if Love you that. slow the game down, you got to slow your mind down, get quiet, get still, and give the mind a chance to settle. And this. There's like this calmness, like I know him, I spend too much time. We share a wall and like, even listening to when he delivered it, it was like, yeah, like that is the last thing you want people to hear is slowing the game down is all about the practice. Like Alan was saying earlier, slowing the mind down and the more familiar you are with that process, the better you're going to be able to implement it in game. And I think that's my favorite selfishly my favorite part of mental training as a teacher is clearly connecting the practice of laying down next to my bed when i tell a 16 year old to do that he's like how is that going to help me hit 95 in a showcase coming up and then we go through exactly how because the better we get it returning to the breath your thoughts are coming homework girlfriend dog poop chores you take the trash out breath i got to get back to my breath the more we've done that, then when we're in a game, scouts in the stands, girlfriend not in the stands, this, this, no, Brett, back to my process, pitch to pitch execution. And you have that practice slowing the mind down, which in turn will help you slow the game down. And so that's how the simplest way of here's how laying down in silence can help you be a better athlete. And you can apply that to many other parts of life, like we've been talking about panic attacks. Test taking, I know for high schoolers is a big one where you get that test anxiety. And so just practice slowing the mind down will help you implement it in a game. I love how you connected the dots. And originally when I was thinking about how we're going to start this conversation, I wanted to bring in a video clip and I may still put it in here when I release this five time, but I'm sure we've all seen the movie, The Natural. That final scene where everything just slows down and he sees that ball big. And for those of us parents who haven't experienced that 94 mile per hour fastball, haven't been in the box, haven't been on that mound, would you describe that as a fairly almost accurate depiction of what it feels like to have the game slow down for you? Yeah. It's a magical place, that feeling of when the game does slow down, it's basically what it means to be in the zone or to be completely locked in. It, it slows down to the point where it feels like you're outside of your body looking, watching yourself play. You're on such an automatic pilot at that point. And because 95, <laughs> usually <laughs> you, when I see 95, from the side, from the sidelines now, it looks like a blur. Like I, I look at it and like, how did I ever hit that? I don't understand how I hit that, but it somehow slows down. It somehow slows down. You see it slower, bigger. It's a trip. And part of the reason I wanted this program to come out is because I wanted players to feel what I felt. I wanted them to feel that feeling. It was the most magical feeling I've ever had as an athlete. And I wanted to get there as often as humanly possible. 
because there was nothing more fun to me than playing really well at that level. So that's when this program took off for me. When all of a sudden I was having success and the game started slowing down, I was having more fun. I'm like, I am all in it now. I do not want to miss one day of this breathing. And when you're a professional player, like I was a position player and you're playing every day, that's the beauty of being a position player. You're playing every day. When you are locked in like that, you want to keep that ball rolling for as long as humanly possible. So I would not miss a day of my breathing meditation before a game. I did it before I left for the field every single day. That's amazing. And uh, as you're describing it, and, and I'm thinking back to that, that scene, I can understand that magic. I can understand how it would be game changing and coming back to that radio analogy, it's literally for all trying to listen to a ball game and everyone's listening to 1 AM with all that crackle and that noise, and you're getting that crystal clear HD delivery. You're having a much better experience and you imagine competing against everybody else listening to those AM radios, but you've got that HD channel. I want to just add something because it, it ties us all together. I've got to know this woman well, I've done retreats with her. She's a leader in the mindfulness field and really the world now. Her name is Dr. Shana Shapiro. She teaches, she's a professor at Santa Clara University. And uh, in, early on in one of the retreats, she said a lie. She's used it two different ways. One is what you practice gets stronger, but I like the other version, which is you become what you practice, which we tweet all the time, as you probably know. And to me, those five words can really change someone's life overnight because think of it. I really look at the second word. The fifth word, of course, is the key word practice, but I really look at the second word become, and you want to, you want to have a, like with Jim's analogy with the water, if you want to have a stiller mind, then practice being still every day. If you want to have a quieter mind and practice being quiet every day. You want to slow the game down, which means slow your mind down, of course, practice slowing your mind down. It's not once every 13 days again. This is every, think about what Jim just said. This is around 1990, 1991. This is over 30 years ago, if not earlier than that, but about, let's say around 1990, he was going to the field every day because driving home in traffic, he was starting to realize I'm doing X and Y is happening. I'm doing this breathing exercises. I'm meditating. I'm doing some yoga stretching. And the effects were clearly pretty profound, if not very profound to him. And so he started playing better because of it. The game was slowing down, whatever else you want to throw in there. So again, I want to keep coming back to this angle because it does come back to the mental warrior program, which is, it is about practice. Look again, we love talking about the process. I, I, I know that if I'm going to, if any of us are going to do with a player, we're going to talk about the process. That is a very big piece. So I don't want to downplay that, but it is, I've said a million times, probably every article and every podcast I've ever done where the rubber hits the road <laughs> is the practice. And my book, by the way, it has eight chapters in it. Two of the eight chapters are all about meditation and mental practice. So I just wanted to just keep harping on this point. Jim said, even if it's two minutes a day for the first week or two, this we want to be clear about this. We're all saying the same thing. And we've all experienced it in our own ways, by the way, too. This is a practice. There is, you're not going to the gym for two weeks. You're not taking BP for two weeks and you're good. And you're not going to go out and throw for two, two weeks. And then you're good for the rest of the season. This is as black for us. This is black and white as it gets. If you want to be clear, more relaxed, more quiet, less thoughts, more in the present, less in the future, less in the past. I can go on for an hour with skills that you want to quote unquote, develop or get better. At. And if you want to get better at anything in life, we know historically it's about a practice. So I just, I want to keep pounding this over and over. And I hope people appreciate that line that you become what you practice. I love that. There's a point here where. I can see where parents might have like what I would call particle conflict. 
So in the first two steps, you're really talking about finding quiet. But step three, we're now going through guided meditation and possibly with music or without music and with words. How do you reconcile quiet with guided meditation? For me, the meditation, it's actually at times easier to be quiet with the guided meditation because you're following along to a voice. You, if you are following along to the voice, you're technically not thinking about other things. What do you have to do later that day or what game is coming up or what test you have to take? So if you're following along to the voice and you're really following it, it gives your, it gives the mind a place to go. It gives, it gives it a one place to go rather than the 10 places or a hundred places that it could go. A and focal point. Exactly. It gives it a focal point. So when I'm doing the guided meditation, when I'm listening to it, I'm following along because I know if I'm following along and I'm hearing every word and every syllable, my mind's not elsewhere. So it's, it's very powerful. It, it, like you said, it gives the mind a focal point, someplace to go. Yeah. And if we apply like the same kind of principle or example to our physical practice, there's going to be a certain value that I get once I have a baseline of skill and history with, let's say hitting, I'm going to get some value out of reps on my own, hitting off a tee and just feeling it and being free to analyze myself. But there's going to be tremendous value as well. If I have a hitting coach there in a different training exercise where he's going through each rep with me while I'm hitting off the tee. And so you can look at it like that, where the first step is just baby step. Second step is more counting your breath. You're dictating everything. And then that third step, the guided meditation, which is really where this all kind of started, because that's what Alan would take us all through in the camps at the end of the days. And it's like, my brain's going there right now. It's a totally different transcendence because you're almost free, right? You're free because they're doing the work for you. The voice is guiding you. They're telling you exactly what you should be focused on. They're leaving space. So there's still time for yourself. But there was some times out at Pierce college where I felt like I was in the stars at some point, like we'd come out of it and it was just like this magical, magical place. And so I, there's pretty cool value in, in both versions, whether it's you're dictating yourself or following along to the voice. Yeah. I remember when I first started learning about guided meditations back in college and I'd help a bunch of my friends. Unfortunately, it was a lot of mental challenges in that group. I don't know what that says about me, but definitely the guided meditation certainly helped. And when I think about, okay, so we've talked about these first three steps, right? With the implementation of lying down, the breath, and now the guided meditation. I think about that literally as you, you said, it's the training. It's just like going to the gym, getting in all the work. My muscles are strong, but I'm not deadlifting while I'm in the box. And I'm certainly not hanging from doing chin-ups while I'm pitching. They're similar movements that where it all meets is I've trained it. Now the process is how do I use everything I've trained, right? The brain, the breath, the process in the game. And so what I loved is how you combine that all together. And Jim, I'm curious for you, because I know Alan had this conversation with Sammy on his podcast about helping him discover what the process meant for him. But when you first discovered your process, what did that look like for you like, in identifying it and putting all of these things that you've trained into success? The first part of this process, when you're stepping into the box or whatever you're doing, is taking a deep breath. And a deep breath is always a great st start. You hear coaches screaming at kids, usually in the sidelines to take a deep breath. It sounds completely frantic. And, but what if you practice deep breathing in a quiet environment for months, years, a decade, and that deep breath now in the bat batter's box. And by the way, I'm breathing 
in the dugout and I'm breathing on the on deck circle. And now I'm breathing in the batter's box. That deep breath is now going to trigger. Hopefully all that great training I did taking me back to that quiet place in my mind. If you take one deep breath, it's great. But if you've never really practiced it, it has maybe some limited effects. And so for me, and this is all vintage Alan Jager. This is all him. I'm, I am so blessed to have trained with him because this, the breathing practice, game changer, the process, game changer, because you can think about a hundred different things when you're hitting and trust me, I've done it and it is not fun. It's not fun to play. I was playing so bad in one of my seasons. This is in AAA, okay? In AAA, I started the season off where I didn't get a hit for the first seven games or something like that. And it felt like an eternity. And we had this scoreboard in left field, this massive scoreboard that had our batting average on it about three feet tall. This massive batting average. And my batting average was zero, zero, zero. And about game seven, I'm stepping into the batter's box thinking and thinking this as a player, just trying to process this. I'm thinking as a player, some of the people that are coming to this game right now, this could be their first game of the season watching, and they could think that this is my first game playing. But I know as soon as I get my first hit, there's going to be a gasp in the crowd because the next at bat, I'm going to be 0.028 or something like that. And I was literally thinking as a player, I don't want to get a hit because if I get a hit, it's going to show my true batting average, which is hideous. Think about that. You cannot be farther away from a process than that. So when I let go of all that and got back to what, no matter what, I don't care if I'm in batting practice, if this is a practice game, if we're up by 20 or down by 20, you're going to get in there. You're going to take a deep breath. You're going to get balanced. You're going to see the ball well, and you are going to attack. End of story. End of story. That's it. Broken record time. Every single time. That is a game changer, and that takes practice because the off-the-field breathing practice helps that process in the game, because if you come into a game with a scattered, frantic mind, you're not going to have the presence of mind be like, you know what? I'm just going to follow my process today with a deep breath and see the ball. No, you're going to be thinking of a million things. So the off the field breathing goes hand in hand with a very powerful process on the field. And when you mix those two together and they're working in harmony, like I say in the video, you're a bear to deal with. Yeah, I remember. Sorry, Brian, I just want to, 20 seconds. Yeah. I just want everybody who gets a chance to listen or watch this podcast um, to rewind to when Jim said, take a breath. He said, I think get balanced, see the ball clearly and attack. Okay. Now I can't say this for sure, but knowing Jim for 35 years and talking about him with this stuff forever. My guess is more or less, he just told you his process and not that he wouldn't tweak it or couldn't tweak it. He might use different words, but if you go back and rewind how he said it and the energy and the conviction and the clarity, I want everybody to be able to recognize that's how important the process was to him. And he changed his default, meaning instead of the million things where his mind could have gone, especially it, we talk about an athlete that's maybe doing okay and they're not in that. We're talking about athletes that can be in a, a very challenging place. And so the point is just the clarity behind this process and how strong that was. And you can get the feeling from listening to Jim that when he showed up every day, he didn't care what country he was in anymore. Yeah, he was in AAA trying to get to the big leagues. No, that's obviously that is a major distraction and can really hamper athletes. So you could feel his conviction. He can't, that's my, here, back to you, become what you practice. You could feel it from Jim that he had become his practice. He had become his process. And now when he got to the game, whether 
is it in whatever irrelevant because he now knew he had his process in place that he trusted was going to lead to his best approach possible, which could lead to his, which would lead to his best outcome possible. And I love the fact that he was so clear and, and it also just came out of him. Like it was happening yesterday, by the way. Yeah, for sure. Now, I don't know if you remember, it, it was probably must've been about three years ago where I, I, I had some video of Sammy pitching and what stood out to me was whether it was in game or when we're in a bullpen, I'm watching that video and you can see him take that deep breath and he works quick, but he always took that time and it just, it was ingrained. It just became a natural pattern. And, it, and even to today, now he's 17, it's a whole different thing. It's, I thank you for introducing us to that like way early on, because like you said, that happens there already. And he just goes on there and he just attacks. Doesn't matter what happened on the field after he lets go of the ball. He doesn't think about it. Get the ball back. Breathe. Attack. That's it. That's why we do what we do. Because whether it's Sammy and hearing that story, which now we feel like, yes, it's changing his life on the field. But we also know ultimately it's changing his life off the field. And for us, the greatest things that happen that we get, the greatest feedback we get Yes, we love hearing about guys going from 90 to 98, okay? Or guys that are staying healthy year-round and coaches that are all of a sudden, their pitching staff or their, we shouldn't talk about pitching. Their whole team now has become very healthy. But when, I know personally, when I get a call, I know I'm speaking for Jim in China. I just talked to a, I was at Oregon State for six days, three years ago, and I, one of the players played a little bit of pro ball. He's married now, but... You could feel it like th this is his way of life now, and he is very grateful. And for us, that's obviously the biggest payoff. Hearing your story about Sammy is just another reminder to people like, hey, you learned something. Jim said for a long time ago, hey, I, if it can make me better, and he tried it, and he did X, and he started seeing Y happening. And as you, as a parent, I know it means a lot to you. And the fact that Sammy now has an awareness and is applying some tools. And look, he's at an age where he's applying them now. As Jim said, what happens if you really do meditate, do some breathing exercises really every day, even if it's just 10 minutes, but you do something every day and it turns into a month and it turns into a year. And for Sammy, it's three years from now and four, all of a sudden it's, you become what you practice. You start thinking about how that the mind can dramatically change for the better. I want to wrap up with two, two last questions. So number one, an easy one is, you know, why the program now and how they can, how people can find it and details about what it costs and how to get started. So let's start with that one. Yeah. You want me, Jim, or you want to go? Sure, go for it. No. So the why now question, I think. The world over the last three years has changed a bit. Um, we love human to human interaction, training, camps, clinics, lessons. But in March of 2020, the world lost that. And uh, we wanted a way that we could train anybody anywhere. And one of the ways we've done that with Thrive on Throwing with the arm care. And so I think it was just one of those things we've wanted to do something like this for a long time. but. The opportunity that was unfortunately presented to all of us during the pandemic was we had time and we couldn't see people face to face and we got comfortable on zoom and different things like that. And so I think that's at least my version of the timing answer. And then where you can find it is jagersports.com. It's the price of a J band. It's 34 95, the exact same price. It's actually cheaper because there's no shipping because it's digital and uh, yeah, it's a 10 part video series that starts as basic as we can. Cause we want anybody, even if you're new, you haven't done it before. Like we said, step one is lay down for two minutes and just see what happens. Your brain's going to take over if you do that. And then it works all the way up to a 25 minute guided meditation. And then the four step with a, an in-game pitch to pitch process, whether you're a hitter pitcher, but yeah, that's the why with the timing, where you can get it. And uh, it was a lot of fun because I think 
for me, it was a tribute to, I've been here for 23 years now, since 1999. And it was just a fun process to give back what changed my life on the field for sure. But the impact this training had on me off the field with panic attacks and just bad mental health stuff that I was going through changed my life. I followed Alan's footsteps at Cal State Northridge studying psychology because I was introduced to this at 12 years old. And I laid so still in the first guided meditation with ants crawling on me that I won getting, fo getting focused, staying focused. I was the camper that won the book because I stayed super still 23 years ago. So it was pretty awesome. And time to, this means more to you than just the baseball game. And I know you, you have a, a bigger passion project around mental health. And could you just share with, with everybody about that? Yeah. So I have a foundation called Athletes Against Anxiety and Depression. And I had my first panic attack in 2009 when I was a junior in college, highest draft stock, just everything kind of culminating of my life's journey in baseball. But I had just pushed and pushed away, like I said earlier in the interview, stuff with my mom, the parents' divorce, and I hid it from everybody. I hid the mental health struggles for six years. And so in 2015, when I finally reached out for therapy and got help, it just freed me up. And it was that same thing Alan talked about when he went through what he did in the late 80s, early 90s. Once you get through that other side and you start to implement tools that change your life for the better, I think it's just human nature where you want to help others with that. And so my line always, my struggle in silence was six years and that was brutal. And so my goal with mental training in sports or off the field is shortening the gap between problem and solution. I don't want anybody to do six years of the stuff I went through and the, the things that I use to try to not deal with it and to numb it and different things like that. And so that's why this mental warrior program, it just ties together my passions in life. Jager sports, I've worn this for 23 years and it means the world to me every day. I never feel like I'm going to work. I'm living my passion. And the foundation is just that other piece of, I was almost not here and I'm still here and I want to help everybody else stay here. And this training can do that for sure. I got to tell you, I, I did feel left out. Here I am wearing a Savannah banana shirt. You're all wearing a Jaeger sports shirt. So yeah, I, I, I get that. But 23 years is that what it takes? So you get the shirt then? Yeah. They gave this to me today. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 23 years or having us out for a podcast. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any last words of wisdom, Jim, Alan, that you want to share with our audience about again, why they should be putting this into practice today? I'll share really quick, and then Alan's great at wrapping stuff up. We've talked a lot about this program helping you as an athlete, and it, it does. But I just want to share a quick story. The morning of my wedding, I woke up really early. I tried to go back to sleep. I tried to go back to sleep, and I realized I'm not going back to sleep. I had an adrenaline rush. It was a big day. and. I'm like, I know what to do. I'm going into game seven mode right now. And I'm going to do my meditation that I've done for the last 15 years or 20 years, whatever it's been. And I took this nervous energy and just, I was scared. I wasn't going to remember people's names. And as I'm greeting people and I want the day to go, I want my wife to be happy or my wife to be happy. And I'm just nervous as you would. And I did this long, drawn out breathing session. And I felt that same thing, that same feeling come over my body. Where I'm ready to compete right now in a game seven. Like I am in a different place. I can feel it. It changed my day that day. I enjoyed my wedding day. I wasn't a nervous wreck. I wasn't a babbling idiot. I remembered people's names. I felt that calmness I used to feel in my legs when I stepped into the batter's box, I wasn't that jittery, like your legs are floating and stuff like that. I felt grounded. I felt centered. I felt just balanced. And so Alan had mentioned 
this is a life thing. This is life thing. We have a lot we deal with in life. Almost probably to tell you the truth more than on the athletic field. The athletic field is almost a distraction, right? It's almost a vacation in a way. There's a lot to deal with in life. And this was a life changer. It was a game changer on the field for me as an athlete. It was a life changer. I use it to this day and I'm grateful for it. And, uh, and China brought it up with the mental health aspect. This is a big deal. It's a big deal. Doing something, doing something, getting some oxygen circulating in your brain and uh, feeling healthy. We need it more than ever. Amen. That was very powerful. I feel like I'm in the zone right now. It's just talking about a guided meditation earlier. Jim just took me into a, a meditation. What I would like to say to close, which is funny because he just, he made me think of a story I had planned on sharing, but he just, he just pulled it out of me. 2002 or three, I can't remember, but I spoke at the ABCA in San Diego and it's a long story, but I had no idea how big the stage was going to be. I had been to ABCA's before. I knew it was a pretty big gathering, but I actually thought I might be on some side stage. I really didn't know. I was on the main stage. By the way, I was on the main stage and I followed. Let's see, right before me was Mike Gillespie and two before, and then right after me, I, it's a, it's hysterical. So I knew when I was going to go up and speak, this room was so big that the TV screens is on the side, don't even point anymore. And they point to the sides. And, uh, and I think looking back, it was one of the most challenging experiences in my life. This was not a game anymore, right? I'm not, I don't have a uniform on. Symbolically, you can say it's similar, but, and I remember I opened a door near the back wings where I was going to come in from behind. I knew where to go and I, and their doors were locked. I'm like, well, I'm in the, I had, I think I had about an hour and I opened a door and luckily there were a couple of women in there and they were with the ABCA, but they were just hanging out. And I just said, Hey, do you guys, and it was a big room. I said, do you guys mind if I just come in there and. I might have said do some stretching, which I went into a pose that these guys know well called Colossana, which is basically you put your knees over your head and it's an inversion and it gets blood to your head. And anyway, it's a position I love, like Jim loves it, that's a pose called Uttanasana. And, and I just remember I might have been in that pose for 20 minutes. These two women were literally just in there. I had no idea what they were thinking. It didn't matter to me. I just had to go there. It was purely instinctive. It was survival mode because this was a big deal. It, I was at the time, um, let's see, Oh, two, I was still maybe 28 years old. So I was still, no, I can't be, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy, 38 years old. Is that right? 94. Anyway. And I went on stage and I'm not saying I still didn't have things going on, but for the most part, I went on stage and I. It was amazing. I had an unbelievable 50 minutes on stage and, uh, and I just look back to that experience is it's thank God I had this space, as Jim said, in place. I think the way to close, I, I would like to close this, just a another reminder about awareness and education, which is why this video was done and which, which is why I wrote my book 30 plus years ago. It's to bring awareness and education. I think any parent listening to this, any coach listening to this, whether you're a coach in the high school, college, or you're a little league coach, or you're a travel ball coach, make time. I wrote an article called mental practice plans, which is a takeoff on practice plans, basically saying, if you're going to practice physically for two, three hours a day, and you have zero minutes dedicated to mental practice, it doesn't make any sense clearly. And so the idea is that is to make this mental practice part of your daily practice, A, and B, back to the awareness point, I just hope parents and coaches, I don't care. It's funny. He mentioned the kid later. It's right over Jim's head. It was Hunter Green at seven years old. It doesn't matter. And the only reason I bring up Hunter is because I want people to realize that here's a major league player who, when you look at him, and granted, I'm going to give him up almost all the credit to him. His parents are amazing, but, uh, but I guess at the end of the day, him getting integrated at seven, I want parents to realize that whether your kid's going to be a major league player or not, 
This is about life. And so get them learning the musical instrument and learning the language at seven. Get them integrated as early as they can. We can't rely on the parents also to do all this work. These kids are away from home most of the day. These kids have these phones now and these technical gizmos. It takes a village, but I just want this awareness now to be as early as possible. Start peppering these kids, even with little things like, hey, let's play a game with your breathing. You can do it with a six or seven year old. Let's play a game with your breathing. Anything to change the narrative, because as we all know, between COVID and really working backward before COVID, between the cell phones and the video games and the so on and so forth, there is so much stimulation out in the world right now. And I just feel like we're at a point, we're at a critical point in, in our world where we need to start shifting back to being quiet, being still, making time each day to relax. And, and I feel like everything in life, this comes back to awareness. And I think that's the last word I want to use is we need to be aware and we need to be proactive with practice. I want to thank you gentlemen for bringing the focus in on helping kids become mental warriors. Cause it's exactly what we need today. Thank you, Brian. Thank you a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brian, for doing this and appreciate really your passion for this as well.